Good evening. My name is Sofia Kalanzakos, and I'm a professor of environmental studies and public po policy at NYU and NYUAD. Welcome, everyone, to what I promise you will be a wonderful talk and the signature event for the Arts and Humanities Environmental Research Initiative this fall. Last semester, the Dean of Arts and Humanities, Robert Young, tasked us with launching the Earth Humanities Initiative to create a more permanent place for environmental dialogue across academic disciplines. Earth Humanities at NYUAD seeks to generate new curricular impulses and synergies across disciplinary boundaries in the study of the environment. Through a range of programming, outreach, and research opportunities, the initiative will help foster the birth of new perspectives on the study of environmental topics in the Anthropocene. With a view of interdisciplinary cooperation and coordination, faculty, researchers, and students from the humanities, but also across academic divisions, will have the opportunity to think and rethink some of the major transformational challenges confronting humanity and our planet, aggravated by a rapidly changing climate. Are the arts and humanities new in this discourse about the environment? Of course not. But never before has it been so vital for us all to be able to talk to each other in ways beyond science and data production. Never have we needed to move out of our silos and embrace a more holistic and interdisciplinary understanding of the world we live in. We need to tell our stories, old and new, write them, recite them. We should open our minds to philosophy, literature, history, theater, film, music, the power and inspiration of the visual arts, because they will help us connect the dots and understand what is at stake in the Anthropocene. How transformations in this new epoch will impact both the environment and society. Tonight, Charles Siebert will transport us to a world that we are part of, though we often forget. Think of what it would mean if we could find ways to heal the severance between ourselves and fellow animals. We could learn more about and from their languages. We could only enhance the capacity for empathy that Charles's work has consistently reflected. Charles is an award-winning author, journalist, poet, and one of us. He is part of the NYUAD family, but above all, he is, as you soon should discover, a passionate storyteller who will shed some light on what on earth the animals are saying. Join me in welcoming Charles, and do keep an eye out for postings about Earth Humanities events and programming throughout the year. Finally, our deepest thanks to the NYUAD Institute for hosting this talk and for our ongoing collaboration. Charles. That was driving me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> A ping. Thank you, Sophia, for that. That's great. And thank you to the Institute um, for having me and to Dean Young for supporting this initiative. Um, it's really exciting. Um, and it, thank you all for coming. This is quite a packed hall. Um, what are my sunglasses doing up here? Um, I have to, for my own dignity and your sake, clarify that. I, I'm not Dr. Doolittle here, <laughs> the real life Doolittle. I'm not answering this question in any literal uh, sense. Uh, but that said, uh, I am positing, uh, I am assured from all the writing I've done, there's a lot of n intriguing non-human languages uh, being spoken out there and they're no less profound for being beyond the bounds of our comprehension. Um, so, you know, there are examples of this. One small one is starlings. Right now, scientists are studying starlings. Why? Well, they, they have realized they're such inventive, uh, so intactically uh, inventive and complex that they're studying their language to understand the origins of ours. Um, Cross-special uh, edification. Um, a flip side of that is there's a woman in the Caribbean who I've written about who's studying 
dolphin language, but she's, and these are wild dolphins, she is hanging out in the water with the dolphins and has a specialized computer developed at the University of Georgia or Georgia Tech that speaks dolphin to dolphins. So <laughs> that's, that's a whole flip. But there's a cruder uh, example of that dynamic, and it's a lovely story told to me by uh, a former night watchman at the Cleveland Aquarium. Uh, he'd walk through the aquarium at night after hours. Um, and believe me, an aquarium at night after hours is one of the most wonderfully eerie spectral places you'll ever walk in. And I know this personally because I had an appointment with a Pacific octopus once um, for a story about animal personality for the New York Times. And I asked the Seattle Aquarium if they would um, set up this uh, meeting uh, after hours. Because as a kid, I always dreamed of being, you know, we all do that, after hours at the museum, after hours at the aquarium. So I wandered through and I had my meeting, my interview with uh, the octopus. But this, this night guard was wandering through the Cleveland Aquarium. And as he did night after night, he'd hear the click, click, click of the lone dolphin there. And lone dolphin is the operative phrase here. Dolphins do not belong alone. They're very, very social, um, intelligent animals. And he took it on, upon himself to approach the side of the pool and listen more closely to the click clicks. And he then looked down and saw his handcuffs. And he remembered the sound handcuffs make. And he took off his handcuffs and he started click, click, clicking. And within moments, the dolphin appeared and cocked its head. And in the ensuing weeks and months, and however long he worked at the Cleveland Aquarium, they would have nightly conversations. A dolphin and handcuffs. I don't know. That's why I love <laughs> writing about animals. Uh, for I don't only write about them, but among other things, I find they make for better interviews than people do. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but to be honest with you, uh, edifying, having edifying stare downs with wild elephants and whales and parrots is about the last thing I ever thought I'd be doing. Um, OK, I'm going into my slideshow. Uh, because I grew up uh, here. That's East 37th Street uh, and Avenue M in Flatlands, Brooklyn. Um, we're that one right there, the three in from the right. Uh, seven of us, seven children were raised in <laughs> that little house. Um, the closest I got to a wild animal in that house was my Sicilian mother, um, who, who I remember, indelible memory of her charging out from the back kitchen with pots of boiling water to vanquish the ant's nest that occasionally sprouted in the sidewalk out front right here. And I have that memory of us standing there watching these little furled insects, like, you know, f f go away in rivulets. And it's like order and dominance has been reestablished in the universe. Um, but uh, <laughs> beyond that, uh, must have been a Cold War thing. But, but beyond that, uh, you know, I was part of a gang, the 37th Street Gang. And we all had names. So it was like Ditch Dirt, Mousy, Seb, um, uh, uh, Bobles. I got saddled, unfortunately, with Chucky Bucky Beaver. But if those guys were here now, they would be like, sorry for this, but hey, Chucky, what are you doing over here? You're embarrassing us. You're talking about animals. Talking. You're making us look bad. This is the way I actually talk, but I thought I'd never be hired here if I talk, <laughs> talk that way. So I put on this false voice that I'm talking to you in now. Um, anyway. The joke turns out to be on them, because guess what? We've gotten our microphones into the highest treetops, into the depths of the ocean. And what have we found? Parrots and whales and their ilk have gangs. And they have their own names and their own dialects. So stuff like that makes you think about what on earth are they saying. That's pretty, pretty mind-blowing stuff for me, anyway. Um, I think one of the things that keeps us from hearing Animals is our inability, our own inability to see ourselves as animals and animals as themselves, as individuals beyond our allegories and our symbolizing and our showcasing. And I think 
one of the classic examples of this is, is, is one I found in this book. Uh, <laughs> it says it all, the metaphysics of ape. Um, I was traveling around the country visiting US, visiting with the captive chimpanzees while I was reading this. Uh, anyway, what, I, I've never known what to make with that cover. Like, is that chimp got a diploma? Or I sometimes think it's Red Peters, who's the fictional character in Kafka's short story, A Report to an Academy. I don't know if you know this story, but this is about a chimp stolen from the jungles of West Africa, brought to Europe, and Red decides that his best chance of avoiding a lifetime in zoos is to learn to become an accomplished musician. And he pulls it off and becomes this weird chimp hybrid human who plays music. And he gives a report to the academy, a room full of scientists, to tell him how this happened. Um, and um, so I think that that's read either on the way to the lectern or on his way back. Um, who knows? Um, anyway, it was while reading this book that I came upon a, a, uh, the curious story of this guy. Um, this is Rembrandt's famous uh, anatomy, the anatomy lesson of Nicholas Tulp. And Tulp was um, uh, one of the leading figures of the early Enlightenment in the 1630s and 1640s, uh, anatomist, surgeon, mayor of Amsterdam in his free time. Uh, and, and there he is holding with the forceps, um, obviously. Uh, and Tulp mostly explored the human body, but uh, in 1640, a real life Red Peter arrived at the dock in The Hague, a, dust, a Dutch East Indies merchant ship coming back from their uh, trading expedition, stopped in, they believe, Angola, and picked up a chimpanzee and brought it to The Hague. And they believe, historians believe this is the first chimp that ever touched European soil, and you can imagine what kind of impact this made on Europeans. You know, it sat on the dock for however long, and whoever saw it must have been like, you know, this human-like creature from seemingly outer space. It got quickly dispatched to the uh, menagerie, private menagerie, of the Prince of Orange, and Tulp sat in the menagerie and sketched this chimp for his notebooks. And that is what he came up with. I don't know about you, but that does not look like any chimpanzee that I've ever seen. Uh, it looks more like a hairy potbelly drunks, you know, sleeping it off in a park. Um, and notice the tapered hands and feet. He called this Satyrus Indicus, the satyr from the Indies. And what's interesting about that is in ancient Greek, Roman, and Southeast Asian folklore, ape-like creatures were always portrayed as satyrs, drunken, lustful, woodland gods who chased and raped women. That's what, it, that's what an ape was. So now this chimp arrives, and the leading anatomist of his day won't allow his own hand to draw what he's seeing, but he instead draws the myth, um, which is really just, it, it does fascinate me, even though it's 1640. Um, he hewed to the myth, uh, telling. We, we like to think of that as a relic of the past, but then meet that guy. That guy is uh, Roger. Roger was um, a, a chimp that grew up, well, he was born in a roadside circus. He was sold to a family in Connecticut when he was an infant. And like most people, they get a pet, they think it's a good idea. And they, after three years, they went, oh, well, this. So they got rid of Roger. And they sold him to a circus trainer. And Roger, for 10 years, became a cellist in an all-chimp orchestra at Ringling Brothers, OK? And um, after his career as a cellist ended, he, he the things we do, uh, he ended up bouncing from one depressing roadside zoo to the next. And in the end, to his good fortune, ended up in a relatively nice um, 
uh, retirement home for chimp entertainers. Okay, there is such a place. And uh, that's where I met Roger. Um, and <laughs> it's so crazy. Um, he, when I walked into that, this is while I was writing that story about chimps in captivity for the New York Times. When I walked in, he had a particularly strong reaction to me. Roger was terrified of other chimps because he'd only grown up among humans. So even among the retired chimps there, he couldn't deal with them. So I walk in, and Patty Reagan, who started this place, was just startled. Like, wait a minute, I've never seen a chimp react this way. And as a kid who like, lingered too long in the ape house at the Bronx Zoo, um, I was like, kind of smitten myself. Um, and she had never seen anything like it, so how did I respond to this? I said, could I move in here with Roger? Not in his enclosure, but I, I saw that she had a cabin, a cottage on the ground of this place. She said yes. So that made for a really interesting conversation with my wife. Honey, uh, we live in Brooklyn. I, I'm, I'm going to take off for a while to move in with a chimp in Florida. And she was like, fine. <laughs> Go. <laughs> let's, let's get out of here. So anyway, uh, the story of my days with Roger is the one I tell in this book, which is about the worst title in the history of publishing, but I was... I was strong-armed <laughs> into it. I wanted to call the book You Man Z, but um, there was some reason the female editor who runs this press said no woman will ever buy a book called You Man Z. And to this day, I do not know the reasoning behind that. But anyway, I, I, I called it this. So it, it, it was while reading, um, uh, hanging out with Roger, we just hung out every day. I just sat right in front of his enclosure. We read books together, by which I mean I would read. He'd love the pictures, and chimps love images. Um, and um, one day while doing that, I came upon the modern day, another modern day distortion of an animal's true nature. And this one also, after all those years after Tull, perpetrated by a scientist. This is Lucy. Lawrence Temerlin, a psychotherapist at the University of Oklahoma in the mid-60s, decided... He and his wife decided how interesting it would be if we got a baby chimp and they got Lucy year, like day one, rested from her mother and brought her back to Oklahoma and raised this chimp as their daughter. Um, most people, like I said, with Roger, they get rid of their chimp after three, age three or four. The Temerlins, <laughs> one thing you have to admire them for, they stuck it out. They raised Lucy for 12 years in their home as their daughter. And he wrote a memoir about this, which is, without a doubt, the strangest memoir I've ever read. <laughs> it's called Lucy Growing Up Human, a chimpanzee daughter in a psychotherapist's family, is the title. <laughs> and, you know, I'm sure in the 60s, this sounded like just a really, really cool idea, cutting edge. And believe me, Lucy was on a lot of TV shows. And this chimp, literally sat at the dinner table, the breakfast table, learned how to dress itself, learned how to use utensils, um, had her own bedroom upstairs, um, made pots of tea. Jane Goodall and I were talking about this chimp because I, recently because I knew she got to go see this chimp in this house. She was sitting there, and this woman has seen a lot of things that chimpanzees do, but never this. Lucy came downstairs from her bedroom, went and mixed herself a gin and tonic, came over to the couch and started flipping through magazines. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, and this is Lucy doing her ablutions. Um, and of course, Lucy, from year one, or infancy to 12, you um, have the problem of dealing with a chimp reaching its sexual maturity. Uh, how does Lucy cope with that? She's never seen in all this time another chimpanzee, another live chimpanzee. She only saw images in magazines. So Lucy started to make good use of the family vacuum cleaner. And Lucy, you can't make this stuff up. It's a, Lucy... Uh, 
would read Playgirl. Does Playgirl, Deb, Deb Williams said, does Playgirl even exist anymore? Like, I, I, I don't know, but, but Lawrence uh, uh, Temerlin, Maurice Temerlin, who's, whose idea this was, he thought like he had this epiphany in the store one day while he was buying some goods. He went, if I'm going to be a good father to my chimp daughter, I should bring her Playgirl. And he brought back stacks, and Lucy either with, that's Jane Temerlin there, so either with uh, Jane or by, by her, um, herself, Lucy would uh, look at the centerfolds in Playgirl magazine um, and do other things with the centerfold that I won't. Um, and, and he has pictures of that in the book, too. But I'll stop there. Anyway, the inevitable happened, which even at age 12, especially at age 12, where the Temelin just went, enough, we just can't do this anymore. Um, what are we going to do with Lucy? So that part of the book is really weird because he's talking about, do I send her to a captive chimps facility in the States and then um, how will my Jewish chimpanzee daughter find the right man? He actually uses language like this. Um, ultimately, he comes up with a decision that one might argue is as equally hubristic, naive. Is there such a thing as naive hubris? Eubristic. I mean, as the original one to raise a chimp as a daughter, they said, let's send her to the wild uh, to try to be a wild chimp. Um, and <sighs> you might sense already from your gasp how that ends up. But um, they sent with Lucy a young intern of theirs at Oklahoma State University or Oklahoma University named Janice Carter. And she was to go for um, three weeks to help Lucy with the transition. And I'm just going to read a little section from um, the Wachula Woods Accord that recounts that um, time. The plan was for Carter to accompany Lucy and Marion, another captive-born chimp, to a temporary holding facility in a small forest reserve near Banjul, the capital of Gambia, to help Lucy get acclimated to her new environment. After three weeks, Carter was to return home to Oklahoma. Lucy, however, became deeply depressed and came down with a number of illnesses, and Carter soon found herself extending her stay for longer and longer periods. In the end, Carter wound up staying at the reserve outside of Banjul for three years, taking on seven other former captive chimps in that time. Then, in the spring of 1979, uh, she moved all nine of her uh, charges to 200 miles inland uh, to one of five baboon islands along the Gambia River, thus setting in motion one of the otter episodes ever recorded in the history of interspecies relations. To facilitate the chimps' transition back to nature, Carter resorted to a radical gesture. She had a group of British commandos who were training on the island, build for her a big wire enclosure. She then took the few possessions that she had, moved into the enclosure, and locked the chimps out. She would become, in effect, the captive that her charges once were, so that they might discover the free wild beasts they were never allowed to be. From the beginning, Carter wrote, the chimps would have to understand that I live in a cage. Carter, especially at the beginning, did make frequent instructive forays into the surrounding jungle to school the chimps, climbing trees, foraging for food, eating everything from figs to ants, living, she wrote, more as a chimpanzee than as a human. She even built herself a treetop platform to sleep on at night by way of encouraging the chimps to build their own nest. The seven chimps she had inherited were all wild-born, and so had some survival skill. Marion, meanwhile, had been in the company of other chimps for much of her life in captivity and was able to in um, integrate with the others and copy what they were doing. Lucy, however, approached matters quite differently. As the largest of nine chimps on the island and the only one who could converse with Carter in sign language, Lucy was yet another evolutionary anomaly that only we humans could fashion the dominant chimp of her group, and yet the one least capable of surviving on her own. She insisted on drinking water, as Carter did, from a bottle and not from the river. While the other chimps would be at the top of a baobab tree foraging for food, 
Lucy would steadfastly refuse to climb, positioning herself at the base of the tree, waiting for any droppings. Carter writes of one instance when Lucy asked her in sign language for help in getting food from a tree. Carter tried to show her a quick way up the tree from an adjacent one, but Lucy took Carter by the hand, put that hand against the tree trunk, and then signed, more food, Janice, go. Carter eventually decided to retreat to her enclosure, stop all communications with Lucy, and leave her to find food on her own. A standoff ensued. Lucy, positioning herself outside Carter's cage, refusing to move, growing more and more emaciated. She'd whine and pluck her hair out and occasionally sign, food, drink, Janice, come out, Lucy's hurt. The story always gets me. When Carter tried to shoo her away, Lucy would go a short distance off and then slowly make her way back to the side of the cage again. This went on for months. Carter reports, and then one day, she and Lucy, exhausted from their struggle, fell asleep beside one another. When Carter awoke, she found Lucy sitting up now on the other side of the enclosure, offering Carter a leaf through the bars. Carter ate some, gave the rest to Lucy, and from that point on, Carter says, Lucy finally began to fend for herself, gradually regaining her health and strength. In 1985, now six full years after she set up her Bamboo Island camp, Carter decided it was time to leave Lucy and the others uh, to their own devices. Lucy had by then seemingly made a successful transition to her new surroundings. She even adopted an orphan baby male chimpanzee and then managed to overcome her grief when that baby died of a stomach parasite three years later. She also survived her own near-fatal bout of hookworm, and by the time of Carter's departure was in good physical health and showing positive signs of social interactions with the other chimps. And yet for Lucy, as Carter would learn in the course of a subsequent visit to the island by boat from her new camp downriver, the boundary between Lucy's former and rightful natural place in the world would remain forever contentious and confused. There's a photograph of that visit of Carter's to the island, one that I um, find almost too fraught to look at. Uh, I don't know how it's coming through. Oh, that's pretty good. Um, I'll just pick up. This was taken in 1986, some six months after Carter's initial departure from the island. Carter had just pulled a boat ashore, and Lucy, always the first to greet any human visitor to the island, rushed out of the jungle to her old friend's side. The two of them sit clutching one another by the waters of the Gambia River, a wall of jungle rising behind them, each of them outcasts of their original selves, like two primates, you might say, passing in the night. Carter, the classic American suburban girl, looking more attuned now to jungle living than her suburban-raised, humanized chimp counterpart. Lucy's head bowed against Carter's chest as though in mortification, her long left hand furled against her face beneath a mournful, downcast brow. Carter had brought with her some of Lucy's possessions from the past, pens and paper, books, a doll, a hat, and a mirror. Lucy, she told me, gave them only a cursory look before standing, looking back at Carter, and then walking off into the jungle. A year later, Lucy's skeleton, minus the hands and feet, would be found on the grounds of um, Carter's former camp near the side of her old wire enclosure. There were no indications of her having suffered a fall or an attack from another animal. One possible scenario of her end, given the missing hands and feet and skin, is that Lucy, still drawn more to people than to members of her own species, approached in greeting a group of poachers who readily seized upon their over-eager prey. Janice, by the way, never left the Gambia. She's still there. I caught her on a recent rare trip to the States, and she's agreed to let me write a book about her life, and I'm going to call it The Woman Who Fell Out of Time. Um, but she works now to save the remaining wild chimps of West Africa and goes everywhere. 
She deals with Chinese mining companies. Anything, any deal she has to cut to try to save the few chimps that are left in the wild. Um, her story just blows me away. Uh, this next, sorry for being such a downer, uh, but this is the stuff we do when we don't see who animals are. Uh, this next slide is of a beast you'll recognize. Um, this is a major protagonist in the story I'm currently writing for the New York Times Magazine. Um, and uh, <laughs> I'll explain more later, but in 2006, the Bronx Zoo made a, a really uh, important decision and announced that they were going to phase out their elephant exhibit on socio-behavioral grounds, quote unquote. And it was one of the first times a zoo, you know, embraced the then emergent science that showed that captivity is unbelievably physically and psychologically devastating to an elephant. And it was a very important landmark um, decision and announcement. And a number of zoos followed suit afterwards. But unfortunately, some have not. Elephants turn the turnstiles, as they say. And three zoos in the US had recently spent millions of dollars on new enclosures, and they needed elephants. And they're hard to get anymore because of existing CITES protections. That's the Conference on the International Trade in Endangered Species. But there are ways around these kind of treaties. Um, and uh, Swaziland is one of those ways. It's one of the remaining open spigots for elephants. And uh, the zoos knew that. And they made a deal to go have, get 18 Swaziland elephants. This is the plane. This is sort of a secretly taken photograph. This is the plane in Swaziland. And um, what's weird about this is they dispatched this plane nine days in advance of a scheduled court hearing that the zoos had agreed to in federal court to decide whether this could happen or not, because there was a lawyer in the States who decided he was going to challenge the permit that they, the zoos got from Fish and Wildlife Service in the United States. So they sneak a 747 to get 18 elephants. Well, I got to tell you, last semester, I, I took off for a couple of weeks in, um, from classes in, uh, among the places I traveled to was Swaziland. And I flew into this airport. This plane is about twice the size of the terminal. OK? There's just nothing there. It's just an airstrip, barely long enough for a 747. And so this is all like the lead into a really bad joke. Like, how do you sneak 18 elephants onto a 747? And of course, you don't. So a curious airport worker saw this thing, this behemoth, started for no you know, animal rights reasons. He was just, wow, look at the 747. This is amazing. And then later that night in a bar, he posted on social media. And sure enough, within a matter of hours, it ends up on the computer of the lawyer back in the States who was trying to prevent this from happening. He gets on the phone to the judge in Washington, D.C. He thinks he's in Washington, D.C. Guess where the judge is? Namibia. Don't ask. And uh, a last minute midnight court hearing here is this thing, this hearing that this guy had been preparing for years. Uh, and now he has to do it on the phone. And the zoo's lawyers, because they can afford high priced, you know, medical experts and everything, came up with a fake story. The judge bought it. As usual, it didn't well, end well for the elephants. Um, but I'm taking it no further because you're going to have to read my story. But this is, this is the elephants um, as they're being loaded or unloaded to then be lifted into the airplane. 18 elephants in a 747. Um, and I'm going to pick up there with this excerpt. Any lingering doubts about Flight 805's mission would soon be settled in a subsequent series of photos taken by a journalist for the Times of Swaziland. In them, reflector-vested airport workers, as well as khaki-clad veterinarians and animal handlers, are seen standing beside or directly atop flatbed transport trailers bearing large white metal shipping crates with lattices of air slats on either side the curved outline of an elephant's back visible within each crate. I don't know if you can see that there. In a couple of the shots, the crates too small for the inhabitants to lie down in dangle in midair as a long arm crane lifts and lowers them to the tarmac below. 
the torsos and hands of the human attendants around them, anxiously craning and caressing at each crate's tilt and sway, gestures of deep care within the constraints of an inescapably cruel act. An airborne elephant, even one with just two front feet aloft, the signature shtick of countless parades and circus acts over the ages is a totem of torture. The earth is to elephants as the ocean is to whales. It is their medium, their world, their instrument. They migrate vast distances across it, along long ago designated and culturally reinforced routes. They cover themselves in it as protection from the sun. They gather the bones of their dead herd members on it for extended and recurring mourning rituals, during which they'll caress the bones with their trunks, taking turns rubbing them along the teeth of a skull's lower jaw the way that living elephants do when they greet one another. And perhaps most vitally, elephants communicate through the earth. They play it like a tom-tom, sending and feeling multi-mile-long subsonic ground vibrations felt through exquisitely tuned sensors in the padding of their feet. A circus elephant has to be beaten into learning how to adopt a bipedal pose. A newly rested wild one slated for air tra transport drugged. But two front feet aloft, or all four at 38,000, is equally aberrant to an elephant. But then life for Flight 805's passengers began in trauma. They were all the orphans of population calls in South Africa, it's Kruger National Park, in order to reduce herd density and make room for us. A gruesome practice that's no matter the method that's employed, sometimes concealed gunmen will make conspicuous sounds in order to coerce the matriarch and the elder bulls to gather around their young in easily dispatched groupings. Helicopters are often employed to herd elephants toward a waiting battery of machine guns. Matriarchs are picked off early in order to render the rest of the herd a lost, rudderless mass. One method eventually outlawed for being too humane, inhumane involved, um, I'm sorry, involved darting the elephants with a heart surgery sedative known as scoline a neuromuscular anesthetic that was, discovered, uh, that was discovered to leave the paralyzed elephants fully conscious as their armed executioners approached to finish them off. In the aftermath of any culling, babies are often tethered to the bodies of their slain parents so they can be readily gathered up for translocation elsewhere. Herds a hundred miles away from a cull will scurry off, huddle, and hide. They are aware of so much elephants, it's frightening. They read remote ground rumblings, discern faraway windborne scents, and hear over vast distance subsonic cries of elephantine terror, screams beneath the register of our hearing, silent screams. Lock up in storage sheds, as park rangers will often do, post-cull elephant body parts and other elephants will invariably come later from miles around to smash their way in, retrieve the remains in order to give them a proper burial. One night at the Makaya Wildlife Reserve in Swaziland, I asked an employee there why I had seen no elephants in the course of that day's safari. I was told that they'd all been very skittish and aloof since the departure of Flight 805 even though the 18 elephants on board were taken from a different reserve 50 kilometers away. Um, gee, I'm being a real downer tonight. I'm sorry. Um, thus my regard for elephants. Um, this next slide, I, I'm not going to read from here, but this is an elephant at the Dallas Zoo where one of six of the 18 that were transported ended up and I watched a keeper throwing apples to this elephant who seemed on the surface to happily receive them. This elephant has been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress five times by clinicians and is on psychotropic drugs the whole time. So, you know, the disconnect between our perception at a zoo and what the reality is, 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 is vast. Um, uh, okay. 
This thus commences uh, what I call a chorus of the misconstrued. Um, this is a beluga whale I wrote about named Nosy, and she has quite the backstory. She was kidnapped from the waters of Hudson Bay uh, off Manitoba, and um, who kidnapped her, but the Navy, the US Navy, um, to be trained uh, along with five other belugas, how to spy on Russian submarines. You cannot make this stuff up, I keep saying. Um, and the reason that happened is because the Navy had been using dolphins as their spies, uh, uh, but dolphins can't swim in the cold Arctic waters, and the Russians had started developing uh, submarines that could hide under the Arctic ice. So some genius at the Navy said, let's get belugas. So Nosy was one of six, but she was brought down to this uh, facility where I went um, in um, San Diego, not exactly her climate. Um, and she was kept in a pen there, often by herself, himself. I think he was, yeah, a male. And um, while there, you know, all these Navy personnel around that facility, hanging around the pen where Nosy was, and people started reporting hearing weird sounds coming. And one day, something very strange happened, which is there were Navy divers working on a pen underneath or by the dock or whatever, but they had these underwater walkie-talkies. And they would communicate with their superior uh, you know, on shore. And you could hear, any, anyone in the proximity could hear that underwater. Nosy was pretty close by. So one day, the divers think they hear, get out of the water, get out of the water, and they rush up to the surface and they go to their commander like, what, what, what's happening? And, and they said, what are you talking about? They said, I thought you said get out of the water. And they said, no, I didn't say anything. So then this whole thing, like, what happened? Who spoke there? And uh, they looked into it, and they realized it came from Nosy. And then they really looked into it. The scientists, very scientists who had been training her to be a spy, her job also was to retrieve test torpedoes underwater. Um, they started putting these fancy sound instruments into Nosy's orifices, and she allowed them to do it. And um, uh, this is what they got. Let's see if I can not botch this. Oh, no. My, sorry. My mouse stopped moving. Nosy. <laughs> Okay, so that went viral. I think I first heard this and got interested in the story of Nosy because I just saw it on the internet one day and a lot of people were talking about it. So the, you know, the immediate response is people giggle or go, wow, this is amazing. It sounds like he's talking through a gazoo. Um, or humming through one of those tissue-covered combs. Uh, uh, but then they put the real sound analysis into it, and guess what? The tones, the rhythm, the octaves were not whale. They matched human perfectly. They were human, as best a, a, a beluga who has none of the <laughs> infrastructure to create that could approximate. And the poignant and pithy part of this is this is spilled beluga. This is an animal who miss, misses its conspecifics. Belugas are called the canaries of the sea because they talk to each other all the time. So in the absence of her conspecifics, all she could think to do to exercise her social impulses, his impulses, is to mime the voices of her captors. That trope um, just repeats itself um, uh, with the next uh, individual in this sad triumvirate. Um, this is um, an elephant from a Korean zoo named Koshik. He was Everland Zoo. <laughs> uh, he was in the zoo seven years all by himself. And uh, he learned how to do this. 
You're not going to see an image here, but I don't think that. Oh, someone told me. Hold on. Someone told me that you won't see the image, but you'll hear. You'll hear Koshik doing his thing. Why aren't you here, Koshik, doing his thing? Uh, hold on. Did it play already? Okay, for some reason the sound on this is failing. It worked when we did a test. But anyway, what Koshik managed to do, he speaks seven or eight Korean words, and what he managed to do, I'll explain in an upcoming clip that revolves around this next trapped beast. I don't know why that didn't work this time. Oh. Okay, well, you know what? I'm a techno dunce, so I'm 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 just gonna take your word for it. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm taking the easy way out. I'm a chicken. Um, this next slide um, or video speaks for itself, I guess. If this one doesn't work, I'm gonna be really pissed. Oh no. Okay. Are there any techie people here? Because you've got to see the. Hello. Oh, here it is. Hello. comes, by the way, courtesy of Robbie Kenner, uh, Academy Award-nominated documentary filmmaker, and he made a documentary based on uh, m my parrot um, story in the Times last year, um, which we're hoping to get Robbie here next semester as part of this initiative. He's agreed to come. He just finished the film. It's really amazing. Um, so I, I met Julius um, in the course of writing this story. And Julius is one of a number of um, orphan traumatized, you know, former uh, pets, traumatized former pet parrots in an amazing sanctuary on the grounds of the LA Veterans Hospital in Los Angeles, in which traumatized former pet parrots like Julius and traumatized war veterans are paired with one another. These are war veterans that resisted all attempts at, at therapy, all drugs, psychotropic drugs, um, and they get in the company of these parrots and they're beyond the um, judgments of human language and the constraints, and they heal uh, in ways they never had. They open up in ways they never had in front of any therapist. And so the whole, I've wanted to write this piece for years, and finally a, a, an editor arrived at the Times who loved the idea, and I got to go out and finally write this story. And you know, it was one of those things where, there's tautologies where you're using language to try to explain what is tacitly a non-linguistic phenomena um, and thus its benefits and graces. Uh, so um, hanging out here was, um, I, I almost became addicted. I just couldn't wait to get, wake up and go back to this sanctuary the next day, surrounded by these parrots. And that, 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 um, um, that leads into this uh, excerpt I'd like to read to you from that piece. Uh, Abandoned parrots are twice traumatized beings 
denied first their natural will to flock, and then the company of the humans who own them. In the wild, parrots ply the air mostly in the same way whales do the sea, together and intricately. Long-time pairs fly wing to wing within extended, close-knit social groupings in which the individual members scientists have recently discovered each have their unique names, the gangs I was talking about earlier. Parrots learn to speak those names soon after birth during a transitional period of vocalizing equivalent to human baby babbling known as subsong in order to better communicate with the members of their own flock and with other flocks. This, it turns out, is the root of that vaunted gift for mimicry, mimicry, which, along with their striking plumages and beguilingly fixed, wide-eyed stares, has long induced humans to keep parrots, neuronally hardwired flock animals with up to 60 to 70 year lifespans, and the cognitive capacities of four to five year old children, all to ourselves locked in a parlor cage, a broken flight of human fancy, a keening kidnappy. There were 34 parrots at Serenity Park, that's the name of the sanctuary. When I was there last summer, a majority of them abandoned and now deeply traumatized former pets that had outlived either their owners or their owners' patients. A parrot separated from its flock will flock fully and fiercely to the attentions and affections of its new human keeper. And when that individual, for whatever reason, fails to uphold his or her end of such an inherently exclusive relationship, the effects on the parrot are devastating. Um, these are three of them. Uh, up and down the Avery Line corridor of Serenity Park are the winged wreckages of such broken bonds. On and on they go, the ceaseless pacing, rocking and screaming, the corner cowering, self-plucking, and broken record remembrances of their past owners. Hey, sweetheart, oh well, come on, man. And yet at Serenity Park, the very behaviors that once would have further codified our parrot caricatures, bird brain, mindless mimicry, mere parroting, and so on, are not only recognized as classic symptoms of the same form of complex post-traumatic stress disorder afflicting the patients in the Veteran Administration Medical Center just up the hill, they're also being seized upon as a source of mutual healing for some of the most psychologically scarred members of both species. The problem with parrots is they're so intensely attuned, Lauren Lindner, the psychologist who founded Serenity Park, told me one afternoon as we stood watching Julius pace back and forth, speaking in Korean. He was owned by a Korean doctor and his wife. And parrots have so many social neurons, their brain is filled with the capacity to mirror their flock. It's so crucial for survival in the wild to be able to know what the flock is doing, to know what the danger signs are, where they have, when they have to get together, when night is falling and they are called to roost. They're so attuned to being socially responsive that they can easily transfer that to us. They have the ability to connect, to feel this closeness with another being, another species. Listening to Julius that day reminded me of a story I'd read not long ago in the journal Current Biology about a 22-year-old male Asian elephant named Koshik, who you saw and didn't hear, that resides at the Everland Zoo in Yongin, South Korea, separated from the age of, uh, I'm sorry, separated from two female Asian elephants. He was raised with, in captivity, Koshik lived alone at Everland for seven years a period during which he construed a way of speaking perfectly intelligible Korean words by sticking his trunk in his mouth and then using his tongue to shape his own plosive trumpetings into the language of the zookeepers and local visitors. Such vocal learning, the researchers who wrote the paper concluded, isn't an attempt to directly communicate with us so much as it is a way for a highly social species like the elephant to cement social bonds via the only other species available to them. It's one of those unlikely natural outcomes of the so-called Anthropocene, the first epoch to be named after us, the prolonged confinement of intelligent and social creatures compelling them to speak the language of their imprisoners. And now, in yet another unexpected turn, parrots, among the oldest victims of human acquisitiveness and vainglory, 
have become some of the most empathic readers of our troubled minds. Their deep need to connect is drawing the most severely wounded and isolated PTSD sufferers out of themselves in an extraordinary example of symbiosis. Two entirely different outcasts of human aggression, war and entrapment, are somehow helping each other to find their way again. I'm going to read one more section from the end of this piece because um, uh, it really speaks to this notion of empathy uh, that infuses hopefully all my pieces and then I'm trying to, um, uh, I don't know, propagate in some way in our consciousness. Uh, you know, empathy is a capacity that, like culture, consciousness, tool use, altruism, syntax, we humans have always thought it's just ours. We got that. They don't. Well, it's not true. We often think of empathy as a skill rather than the long ago neuronally ingrained bioevolutionary tool for survival that it actually is. The ability to inhabit the feelings of fellow beings. The ability to feel, for example, their fear over a threat or thrill over a newly found food source or sorrow over a loss, which has as much to do with the fabric of community as any other emotion. Empathy in this sense can be thought of as a source of all emotion, the one without which the others would have no register. The more time I spent at Serenity Park last summer, the more I came to think of in, the terms, in terms of the expansive anatomy of empathy, and not just the shared neuronal circuitry that has now been mapped across species, from us to other primates to elephants and whales, and we now know to creatures like parrots with entirely different non-mammalian brains, like crows and parrots. I thought as well of the extraordinary capacity conferred by that circuitry to recognize and respond to the specific infirmities, both psychic and physical, those, although those two are the same, um, of another species. I got a sense early on at the park of which parrots and veterans seemed most drawn to one another. The way, for example, the lilac-crowned Amazon parrot Dagwood came to life around Jim Minnick, a former Navy helicopter crewman who did three tours of duty and suffered severe upper body injuries in a fall from his chopper. But I only learned later about the true depth of that bond. You know, Jim, he does a great job of hiding how wounded he was, fellow Navy veteran Matt Simmons told me. He has tattoos all over the elbow he can't use anymore. And he won't talk about it, but at one point he was sitting on the edge of the bed with a shotgun in his mouth and tears rolling down his face. On that same night, he drove his car into a tree, drunk out of his mind. So he comes to Serenity Park, and Jim doesn't know the history of any of the birds. And which bird loved him the first? Dagwood, the one with the screwed up wing and a crooked beak. There's no way to explain it. Jason Martinez, who incurred traumatic brain injuries while parachuting into Afghanistan and now suffers epileptic seizures, was immediately drawn to Molly, an African gray parrot, the only parrot at the sanctuary he only learned later with epilepsy. And then there were the daily cheek-to-cheek -cheek murmurings between the bedraggled golfing cockatoo, Bobby, whose owner kept her for much of her life in a kitchen drawer, people, and a blonde 21-year-old ex-Marine named Josh Lozen. Let's talk about Josh, Matt Simmons said. He's a good-looking guy with curly hair. He's a little scary. He's so broken, all of his wounds are still inside of him. Who gets along with him the best? Bobby, mostly naked, bleeding from her remaining feathers, a bird who looks like a damn pterodactyl that went through a buzzsaw. One of the veterans used to take Bobby around who can't fly anymore and just flap Bobby's wings and run around just so she can get the simulation of flight. Of all the veterans I encountered at the sanctuary, Lozen was by far the most skittish. The one time I was able to chat with him at length was when I found him early one morning atop an elevated wooden porch, one flight above a work shed, scrubbing the bars of an empty birdcage with a brush. My decision to ascend those narrow steps that led up to him effectively trapped him up there. He joined the Marines, he told me, because he wanted to hurt somebody. But he received such an exceptional score in his recruitment aptitude test, he ended up in an office job, working with computers, 
a pose suited to his intellectual capacities, but not to his disposition. Sent to the VA for evaluation after frequent episodes of insubordination and erratic behavior, he was prescribed mood stabilizers and antipsychotics, neither of which he sheepishly confided to me he was presently taken, taking thanks to Serenity Park. He was not able to put into words what exactly went on between him and the parrots. All he kept saying was, it's something about the cages. Feeling his growing discomfort, I descended the stairs. Back on the ground, I looked up at Lozen, who was peacefully cooing and chirping back and forth with Coco, an Australian Adelaide Rosella parrot. He suddenly looked down at me. They're in these cages and helpless, Lozen said, and it's not their fault. He paused, and I started away. But for me, he continued, I think it's also that when I'm alone with them in those cages, I feel I don't have to conform to what everyone wants me to be. I feel I'm free to be an animal again. In the late afternoon, on my last day at the sanctuary, I seemed to be the only one around. I passed Coco in his cage, sounding his particular strains of the park's ongoing symphony of stranded human speech. I thought then of the numerous anecdotes people have told of wild parrots, uh, of, of wild parrot flocks learning via cultural transmission to speak the human words taught to them by reintegrated former pets. In the parks of Sydney, Australia, where there are native wild parrot flocks, people regularly overhear and a hello, darling, or what's happening coming from the trees. The early German naturalist explorer Alexander van Humboldt wrote wrote of encountering during his travels in South America toward the close of the 18th century, a parrot that was the last living repository of the language of the extinct Atores Indian tribe. All alone now among the sanctuary's parrots, I got a sudden glimpse of a possible future, one long beyond us and our traumas, a world of winged dinosaurs, parrots are dinosaurs basically, soaring and chatting back and forth their different local dialects inflected here and there with the occasional broken shards of a long lost one. Hey, sweetheart, oh well, whoa, come on, man. Nearing Serenity Park's exit, I decided to turn back and step inside the quarters of the first parrot I'd bonded with at the sanctuary, an Amazonian kaike named Cashew. I had only to nestle close to her perch, and she immediately hopped on my back, crisscrossing my shoulders as she'd done the first time we met. She stopped at one point and craned toward my mouth for what I assumed would be the equivalent of a kiss. Instead, she began to clean my teeth, her beak lightly tapping against my enamel, the faint vibration strangely soothing. Immediately afterwards, she dropped down and took a nap in my shirt's left breast pocket. It felt as if I'd grown another heart. Then she reemerged and crawled to the top of my head. She strolled about there for a time before plucking out one of her own deep blue-green feathers and then descending to gently place it on my shoulder. I have it still. When students come to my office, they see this feather sticking off the top of my computer and it's it's cashews. Um, I put it in my wallet so for, for months, so it looks a little rustled. But um, Deb Williams asked to play cashew in the feature-length movie being made, and I, I said she could. So, um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, I'm going to um, uh, close with two. Um, the, this next slide, I, I've got to apologize mostly to my mother. Um, that's her, the ant killer. Uh, uh, on the left, um, uh, the mother of us seven. Um, that, <laughs> that, um, brace yourselves, is Mimi virus, the largest virus ever discovered, and scientists think that's the mother of all complex life on Earth. Um, the science behind that is really complex, and I don't have time to go into it, um, uh, but... Um, it has to do with the fact that for, as I talk in my Art of Narr Narrative Science class, you know, for, we, we have a very local, myopic time perspective, we humans, and you know, we don't understand that life didn't begin until about 3.5, 4 billion years ago, and 
for billions of years after that, all that was on the planet were bacteria that couldn't make anything else but themselves in replication. So it was like a one-note planet, and uh, I like to call it. And then what changed that is something got inside one of those bacteria and became the cell nucleus. And that's what allowed life to complicate itself. You know, you part of the cell go be a leg, you be an eye, you be an arm, you walk, you do this. And that's, that's when all we see around us began. So this is all life's mother. <laughs> I feel I have to keep apologizing to my mother. Um, so this is all life's mother or something like it. It's, you know, not every science bu scientist buys this. But um, I wrote a story um, about this incredible finding. It was found in Bradford, England, in a water cooling tower, the home of the Bronte sisters, um, by a disease detective. And I wrote about this story for Discover just to show you that I don't just write about charismatic megafauna. Uh, I think you'll agree that's a, that Mimi virus is a decidedly uncharismatic <laughs> individual. Um, but, you know, knowing stuff like this kind of edifies your thinking, and I... I, I invoke Mimi virus here. Um, well, I'll just read what I've read. Uh, this nearly four billion year old universal relative now, by way of underscoring just how deep a bond it is, we presently share with the other non-human intelligences on this earth right now, whom we're doing our best to shove off of it. Um, and this is the last. Uh, did I? I went there by itself. Okay, this is my favorite, one of my favorite stories in all of literature. Um, it's from Alice Through the Looking Glass. Um, and it's about um, the moment when Alice enters into the woods in which things have no names. And um, she, all at once, she can't remember what to call herself or the trees around her or the strangely fearless fawn that soon approaches her, gently cradling the fawn to her side. The two proceed together through the woods in utter peace and calm. Eventually, however, they come to a clearing whereupon name recognition returns and the fawn bounds away in fright, leaving Alice wholly bereft and forlorn. Carol's beguiling parable about the distancing effects of human consciousness and language the ways in which naming and categorizing can sever us from the very nature of which we know ourselves to be an integral part is always on my mind when I write about animals. It's something of a paradox, but in a sense I try through language to tr transport readers to a place beyond language, to take them back to the woods where things have no name. I think it's important for us as a species now to keep revisiting that place the one where we can best hear both ourselves and what on earth other animals are saying. Thanks. Mm. Please, um, questions, any questions? <laughs> Thank you so much for the talk. It was really incredible. Um, I'm wondering if you have a solution <laughs> to, it's not what you're going to think. Um, Places, for example, New Zealand and Australia, where we have the issue of introduced species that yeah. are depleting the native species. So by being empathetic to all animals, that would essentially mean all the native species disappear. Um, so the other one, if we're saying, or do we say, no, we're going to cull all the introduced species and then still have native ones? <laughs> Yeah, uh, a friend of mine wrote a book called Out of Eden, which was all about this very subject, invasive, the gnarly subject of invasive species. And again, this is a problem that only humans could fashion, right? I mean, but nature fashioned it also. Invasive species made their way into other uh, places on the wind. Um, and 
it begs the question, what is natural? What is the, you know, we, we, we clutch, we humans clutch to a uh, notion of an Eden, of, of, of the wilderness as it was designed, and then we think of what infects it. So um, maybe it's not so much worrying about invasive as how to balance so that nature does find a way to find its own balance. Uh, when I say balance, that's another myth humans perpetrate. Nature's perfectly balanced. It's, it's, a, it's a riot act. Evolution is, and we're speeding that up, that process, that, you know, that cross pollination of species, but that's going to happen anyway. So there's no answer to your question except um, don't do something stupid like bring in the mongoose to get all the snakes and then have it you know, totally dominant. We have to be a little more clever in what we introduce when we do it purposely and then deal with the ones that happen accidentally. But you know, usually it's, um, usually it's a, a very dumb move to bring in a species to take care of one because it causes the next problem. Um, I don't know if that answers adequately your question, but it, it's gnarly. There are so many gnarly problems that define the Anthropocene that, um, that that's what we're here for, really, talking about it. Hi. Thanks Hi. very much for um, all of this fascinating information. I wonder if you are aware of fMRI work going on with birds. I know that they're putting dogs and cats in fMRIs, and they're getting some sense of their brain activity in terms of intelligence and possible communication. Um, I know that Alexander Horowitz is doing this, she's doing this kind of research at Barnard in yeah. New York with her animal lab, right. she's putting dogs in fMRIs. I know that size is an issue, so while we'd probably love to get an elephant in one, that's not possible. But a very pointed question. Are they doing it with birds? Do you know anything about it? Um, I haven't heard yet whether they, uh, well, they've done fMRIs of the structure of the bird brain. And that's when they finally realized how stupid we were being. Um, um, yeah, using the word bird brain, we thought because they have a small part of the brain that in us is huge and, and paramount to our consciousness. And they never found that. There's a nub of that in a bird brain. So they went, they're bird brains. Turns out they have an entirely different evolutionary structure that's behind their consciousness. And so I, I have to tell you, I do not think I'd be writing articles, the articles I've been able to write about animals if it weren't for fMRI. Because whenever it seems like I'm going out on an anthropomorphizing limb, I resort to fMRI and go, OK, I don't have to say a word. Look at this. Look at the homologous structures in the brain. They've done it with whales. They've done it with, um, they, I think they have done it with elephants, by the way. Um, um, and the more we do it, the more it expands our empathy and, and makes us break down these prepossessive um, categorizations we hold on to. We only have this. We only this. You know, we, they've done studies of an elephant, a traumatized elephant brain. There's the same stunting of the neurons that happens in a human brain. And this is something I talk to my, my students about. The brain... People don't realize this, but when a human baby is born, um, for four months, the neurons that are attributed to empathy and self-awareness and sense of right and wrong aren't even present in the brain yet. And they're called spindle cells. And they merge in this part of our brain. And then between the age of four months and four years, um, they grow, sprout, and migrate to the front, frontal cortex. And they become sort of the plant of our um, self-awareness and emotional regula regulation and, and all these uh, properties, not solely that. But for kids who are brought up without a parent meeting their eyes, their, their attachment mechanism and all that, they have stunted plants of neurons. So I, I told that to a couple of friends who just had babies and they, were, they ran home and went. This <laughs> 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 is like, you know, but I mean, it, 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 it's intimidating to know. You know, that simple thing of a mother or, or father looking into the eye of a baby is weaving the neurons that baby's going to need to be, you know, a, a balanced um, moral person. And they've done fMRIs of people who, you know, put puppies in microwave ovens, you know, and they're lacking certain, yeah, empathy neurons. So it's pretty amazing. I mean, like I say, I couldn't do what I do if it weren't for science. Science, it's one of the great... Ironies, but science has allowed us to be imaginative storytellers again about animals. Because for the longest time, it was behaviorists said, you can't go there. We don't even know what another human being is thinking. You can't talk about an elephant. But, 
throw, throw in the science and then you can shut up. You know, it takes all the burden off of me. You know, I don't have to claim anything. <clears throat> this has been fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the things that comes across to me most powerfully is your empathy with your, uh, your subject. Um, and it leads me to question, if you don't mind, talking a little bit about why you got into this in particular. I'm trying to write about that right now in a memoir, and you know, I, keep, I keep thinking, uh, it was the moment that I left poetry, I was a poet, um, and was told, you know, after I started publishing poems, don't leave poetry school, there's no place in the world for a poet. Which, you know, sort of true. But I, 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 I got afraid of staying in just academia, and, and that's a personal decision. I thought, I'm just not smart enough. I don't know enough about the world. My poetry is going to be boring if I stay here. So I took off, and just through happenstance, I started, I never went to journalism school. I didn't know how to write articles, but I, I started to, I proposed an article to a friend who happened to be at Esquire, and the second piece I wrote for Esquire ended up in the Amazon jungle. And uh, I won't bore you the de de details of that. And then the third piece, I was in the jungles of Belize writing about, heh, talk about coming full circle, a guy from Brooklyn, New York, who grew up around the block from me, who was saving the world's last jaguars. And we were hanging out together. You know, he had his own gang. So it was two Brooklyn guys. To, and, and there was a moment when we were tracking a jaguar, and the next thing we knew, like the Jaguar was tracking us, and we turned around and there he was on the road, and he just he had no interest in attacking. He's just like, hey, it's a human being. Like I, you know, he, he just hadn't seen one before. So you know, he's he's the ruler of the roost in that jungle. And I and I started to write my memoir. Well, that was the moment that I fell through the wormhole that made me write about animals. And I thought, you know, maybe that's a lie. When I was a kid, even at the Bronx Zoo, I was the one who stayed too long in the ape house. Um, and you know, my parents would leave and I would just be staring at the, at, the, at the chimp or whatever was in there. And I, I don't know what it is. It's just that I've always been fascinated by the there, what's there, in, in the, behind the stare of a, another being. And I didn't have all the knowledge of how intelligent they are. I just sensed something. And so I, a radio show called me today to talk, and I, because she asked a similar question. And I said, I just have always felt like I can do a kind of time travel when I stare at animals, um, especially you know, so-called higher intelligent animals. Um, and it's free like the veterans, not that I'm traumatized, um, as far as I know. Uh, but, you know, there's a kind of assuagement that comes from just the non-linguistic exchange with a, a fellow sentient being, even if you don't know all the facts about it. So I think I've always had that sense. And to get to indulge it and learn the science behind it, I just really, you know, not to get sucky or anything, but I just feel very fortunate like that, that this happened and that I've been able to travel around the world and, as I say, have these edifying stare downs with, on the animals, what's left of their turf and terms, to have it on their terms, not in a laboratory, but to be out there, you know, in a jungle and see a chimp family up in a tree and, you know, the first time I saw a wild chimp family, I don't know, it just, it does something to you. But, yeah, I, and I... Once I started doing it, I went away from it. I've written a lot about humans, too, and, and uh, the heart and stuff. But uh, an act of cowardice made me go down the path of picking up animals again, and it was because I'd written so much about the heart that the head editor of the New York Times said, hey, I want you to do um, for the brain what you've done for the heart. And I said, kind of different organs? Like, because like, I know where you're going. You want me to write about consciousness. And that, that stumped far smarter people than me. And so, you know what? I called them back and said, I look, and I tried to investigate it for a while. And I called them back and said, look, I can't do that. But I got a story about chimps in a retirement home in, in Louisiana. And he went, do it. And, that, and from there, it got a piece on animal personality, then a piece on elephants, and then a piece. And it was, it was sort of like just a roll. You know, I just kept going. Um, so you, um, you started your science uh, education late, so yeah, I was a dunce in science at school. I had no aptitude for science. This is why I love talking to my students in Art of Narrative Science, because I, it wasn't, it, it's such a weird turn of events. I had no capacity for math, no capacity for science. Poetry led me to science, because I saw, especially in biology, that's the one I have a feel for. I saw the poetry in biology, because what poets do is they take, uh, you know, recondite worlds of emotion and thought and build a metaphoric bridge back 
to understanding. And with, with science, it's when you get into this intercellular stuff, Mimi virus and all that stuff, you know, you're, you're building a metaphor back because if you talk to human beings about you can talk to a science about that stuff and scientists and you're just like, what? You know, could you talk English? So my job is to make a metaphor that makes you feel the essence of the science even though often, even in that piece I wrote about Mimi virus that I was saying in class the other day, I feel like I fully didn't own that subject. But as long as I don't sound like an idiot and as long as the scientists don't hate me for what I wrote. So to me, it's a new avenue of exploration and wonder. Everyone thinks about science that it dispels wonder and, and ruins all the mystery. But Richard Feynman, the genius, said, the physics genius said, why is the moon any less interested? interesting because we know it's not made of cheese and it's made of methane and gas and, 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 and all these other things. And, you know, science just reinvents wonder. It doesn't kill it, you know. So this is why, you know, the, my job and anyone who wants to write about it, I want people to be ambassadors from, you know, the, because science is going off into all these, you know, uh, remote disciplines and we need consilience and writers are, have to do that. Writers provide the consilience to say, this is related to this. I often go to... This guy who was a dunce in science, I go to astrobiology conferences. NASA in the United States is paying you know, millions and millions of dollars for science to come and talk about how Mimi virus happened and how first life started. And this in a country where there's still debates in schools about whether to teach evolution. It makes absolutely no sense. So um, yeah, it's really a wonderful, the world has been found now. I say that in my travel writing class. Physically, ostensibly. We've been everywhere, we, we, the explorers have, but inside that story, the four, point, the four billion year life story, that's like, that's constant mystery and wonder, you know? There's like, it's amazing. Hi, thank you for the wonderful talk. Oh, uh, sorry. That's okay. I'm just wondering, I think it's a little personal, how do you separate well, while you're writing articles and doing interviews, how do you separate emotions or maybe not separate them? Because you're obviously interviewing or, or hear of all those really traumatic stories of animals and your past. So how do you, I guess, gather your thoughts and emotions and, or separate them to not be affected and write an impactful story? I hope I'm making sense. So the trick is, if there's, I can call this a trick, is to be affected or else you wouldn't want to write it. But then in the writing, to give the effect to the reader. So you have, to, you have to suppress the emotion that made you write it and give the emotion back. So it's an act of supreme sharing. Um, but that's what all writing is. You know, you can't... When I first started doing this, I would tend to want to start and get up on a soapbox and go, you... And I go, no, no, you don't have to do that. You just give the story. Let, leave it up to other people's empathy. Let, let them feel what I feel or felt that made me write this. And so I say to my students all the time, your job, after if you've had the experience, if you go off and hang out at the Falcon Hospital, you do this, your job, after you accrue all your research and your experience and you've had your emotion, is to forget it. Kind of forget it. It's in you. Go back to your state of innocence and give us your journey back again. And that's what I try to do in these pieces, so that I write you to where I started crying or I felt it. And believe me, when I write these kinds of pieces, I know it's working when I maybe at my desk shed a tear again. You know, you feel that frisson, you know, but that's what writers, you, that's what you have to do. Keep your hand out of the frame, the picture, but that's when, that's when writing or all creative art gets nearly godlike because you're, you're giving that experience back and all of it's, you know, yeah. So never, you can't, you can't cry at your computer <laughs> when you're writing. You have to, uh, you know, cast a cold eye on your own emotions to give back your emotions kind of thing. Yeah. We're done, I think. Oh, one last? Why do we, uh, so why do we get animals to communicate our language and why do we try to raise other species? as if they were ours, why do we all do this? Well, I didn't hear the first part of your question. Why do we try to get animals to speak our language? Yeah, because we're self-obsessed. Um, we're self-important. Um, we suffer from exceptionalism, uh, all these phrases. Uh, we're, 
we're on our high horse all the time. We're full of ourselves. And what, you know, in my own small way, I try to do is knock us off our high horse and say, you know what, if you weren't, here, if you weren't for Mimi virus, you wouldn't be here, for one. Um, and, you know, you're related. We're all related, you know. Um, so, but that's a great question. It's, it's, it, it, it speaks to our self-importance, our grandiosity. That's why I love the story of the night watchman who went and deigned to speak in handcuff to a, a dolphin. Um, you know, flip the equation. Why not talk their language? You know, the, the elaborate things that other animals are saying. And our judgments, what do, we, what do we normally do? Yeah, they don't have syntax. They don't have recursion. Guess what? They think starlings might have recursion now. That's what I meant by we're studying them because I listen to the fire escape starlings outside our apartment in Brooklyn, and it's crazy. I mean, they weave new sentences all the time. They put in the sounds of the city. You'll hear it suddenly in the middle, like you'll hear car alarms. You'll hear, you know, they, they, they incorporate our sounds, but not just out of mere mimicry. They're just making stuff up. You can, you can hear it. And I would sound crazy if I said that just alone, but now why are scientists studying these to understand our own language, where it came from? That subject is fascinating. I'm hoping one of my students write about it, like, you know, source of language, because, you know, I respect Noam Chomsky, but he's been all about, well, we have some special language node in us, you know, and it's not true, basically. There's nothing that's not biological. It's just not possible to be outside of biology. And I don't think Noam Chomsky believes that either. But th this one little nodule of, for language is not specific to us. But, you know, uh, we just have to get past ourselves and, and parse the other. We're never going to get to Dr. Doolittle land and I'm speaking dolphin today, you know. Um, but, you know, to speak dolphin to dolphin will yield things. You know, it's okay to be, I'll go to Keats's negative capability. It's okay to be in doubt and uncertainty and not understand. Just shut up. You know, we don't have to understand all the time. What are you saying? Do you have syntax? You know? No, just listen. All those veterans listen to those parrots, and you know, it, there's a lot that goes on in the woods where things have no names, I guess, you know, in beyond language. Anyway, I've kept you too long, but. Uh.